Funding for this program is provided by Bruce Foods Corporation, makers of the complete line of Cajun King seafood seasoning mixes and other distinctive Louisiana-style food products. Hello, I'm Chef John Foles, welcoming you to this great state of ours. We're real proud of our people, places, and food, and I'd like for you to know a little bit more about it. So join me and some of my friends as we visit the historical food towns of this state and cook up another great taste of Louisiana. everybody to A Taste of Louisiana. I'm Chef John Fulce and man am I happy that y'all joining me in the kitchen today because we're going to some of the historical food towns of Louisiana. We're going to travel to Tinsaw Parish in and around Lake Bruin, St. Joe and we're going to even travel up to Sicily Island. We're looking right here at Harrisonburg. This is about a hundred miles out of Natchez. One of the great Civil War sites, Fort Beauregard actually existed right here. This is the Sergeant House Hotel. It was a hotel for steamboat passengers during the Civil War. And today, there's reenactments of Civil War dinners actually taking place here. We're now looking at the Ferry Plantation, one of the first homes in Sicily Island around the 1700s. This is Battleground Plantation, the last stand of the Natchez Indians versus the French. And Pine Hill, this is the home of John Bowie, the uncle of the famous James Bowie, Jim Bowie. Here is the little town of St. Joseph, Louisiana, Christ Episcopal Church, one of the earliest churches in the state of Louisiana. This is Carpenter Gothic architecture. This was actually built, you can figure without plans, probably without levels and squares. Talking about squares, this is Courthouse Square and the Davidson home, one of the very early homes. Look, this almost looks like a steamboat, doesn't it? This home, the Pink House, was actually brought to St. Joe, Louisiana on a steamship, bought out of a catalog, and then nailed together by the carpenters once it arrived in St. Joseph. What a beautiful old Victorian looking home. Imagine getting that out of a catalog. This is Tinsaw Parish Library, and it's also the Plantation Museum. In the bottom is the library, but upstairs on the first floor of the plantation is actually a museum of all the artifacts of plantation days. Emily House. I tell you, Miss Emily Bruno is going to be my guest today in the kitchen, and Emily is one of the most fascinating ladies I have ever met in all of my life. Look at me in my hunting jacket here. You can tell that I was in, at St. Joe and on Lake Bruin right around the corner. Miss Emily has been in the restaurant business for over 50 years, and you can see us uh, standing here talking. You know what I'm doing, right? getting a few of Miss Emily's great, great secrets that she's so happy to share. That's her son, and she can tell some stories about the restaurant business. Here is Lake Bruin, one of the most beautiful freshwater lakes in all of Louisiana. In fact, this is an oxbow lake, and this was cut off from the Mississippi River thousands of years ago, and today is one of the best fishing lakes in all of Louisiana. Look at the mallard ducks. I'll be cooking Lake Bruin mallards today, and I tell you, when they're in season, there is nothing better than mallard ducks on Lake Bruin. Imagine the camps and piers that just dot the shoreline of this gorgeous lake, about 14 miles long and about one mile wide. It's probably the cleanest lake in the state of Louisiana. Oh, I guess I'll get some people mad at me because I said that, but it is, and I'll spend a lot of time skiing and doing a little fishing myself right here on this gorgeous lake. That cypress trees that you're looking at in the background, here's one of those beautiful mallard ducks that come in. Look at those gorgeous cypresses. The leaves turn this beautiful rust color and the fog just kind of comes in on the lake during the fall. No more gorgeous sight in all of America than a nice early morning or late afternoon on gorgeous Lake Bruin in Tinsaw Parish. And we're going to talk a little bit later with my good friend, Emily Bruno, who's going to be here visiting in the kitchen. What a fast, you're going to love this lady just as much as I do, I guarantee you. 
what am I going to cook today? Well, you saw those mallards, and I tell you, they come in season. There's uh, hunters that go out on the lake, and everybody's got a limit. You can get one or two of them during the season. And I had some hunters bring me a couple of wild lake brewing mallards to cook uh, for you today. And, of course, please, you can use domestic duck for this dish. You can use Long Island duck. Any other duck that you would get in your own grocery store will work perfectly with the dish that I'm going to give you. But I'm going to do a roasted lake brewing mallard with apple and mayhaw glaze. And mayhaw glaze is a wonderful little wild berry that grows all around Lake Bruin, but you can get it in jelly and jam stores made into jams, and there it's a great coating for wild game. I love jellies. To begin with, we're going to take the ducks, and you can see how nice and clean they are. That's very, very important that uh, when you get wild game that it's nice and clean. Remember, that you always want to season, or I should say over-season the inside of uh, these ducks, whether it's domestic or wild duck, because all of that seasoning will never penetrate the meat of the duck itself. It'll never get through that heavy rib cage, so you want to over-season just a little bit. Into that, salt and pepper, a little bit thyme, a little bit basil, same thing over here. And now I'm going to season the inside with all of my fresh vegetables and fruit seasoning. I'm going to put some nice apples down in here, red and green apples both, a little bit red and green down in here, some celery. You always want to put a celery stick, of course, some nice onions. Come on over here, celery. Some nice onions, more apples. And one of the greatest things about the apples, you see I'm using a lot of apples in the duck. Apples have a tendency, as other fruits like pears and plums, to absorb a lot of natural oils out of anything that it's cooked with. So it's great to put apples in uh, and around ducks as you're cooking it because that natural sugar from the fruit will naturally flavor the, uh, the game, but at the same time will absorb all of that oil. Okay, I'm going to paint the outside of the duck breast with the mayhaw jelly. And this little jelly is going to put a wonderful, just a really nice glaze on the outside of the bird. Look how pretty that is. And then, of course, again, season lightly on the outside of the duck. This skin will be so nice and crispy, you won't even believe how nice that's going to be. A little thyme, a little basil. And then I'm going to put a little touch of my Louisiana, a little bit of my Louisiana hot sauce down onto the bird to give it that little spiciness. You, you of course, can do whatever you would like. Now, look at this roasting pan. Can you see inside of this roasting pan? Look at the apples, and all of this nice meat is going to go down inside of this bird as I put it into the roaster. This is andouille sausage, and the andouille sausage has a lot of natural smoke, but also the fat of the sausage will help to baste the bird as it cooks. So I always put Louisiana's Cajun andouille sausage inside of the bird and around it, uh, to add that natural juice and moisture. Now, a little more apples. Again, look at all the apples in here. Isn't this just beautiful? Let me move this out of the way here. Uh, you can just see how great that dish is going to look even before it cooks, because if anything looks that good, it's got to taste good. Now, I would top this with just a little bit butter, put a lid on top of this roaster, and bake it at about 400 degrees. I like a nice hot heat when I bake game because I like to sear it quickly. You could sear it in a black iron pot, of course, before you even roast it, but I find that that's not really necessary if you're going to cover this with a dome lid because the birds will constantly baste themselves while they cook. 400 degrees for about an hour, hour and a half, and the bird should be perfectly tender. You may even want to try them rare. I know a lot of people who do that. Let me show you. I have some already cooked, and I want to show you what they look like. I'll get them right out of the oven here. Let me get these towels. Boy, wait till you, wait till you get a look at this. Fact is, I'm going to take the lid right off of this so you can gaze into that while I close my oven door. And I want to plate up one or two of these beautiful Lake Bruin mallards for you because these things are just so pretty. Look how gorgeous they've cooked. They're just as tender as can be. I'm going to put one right on top of there, another one. Of course, you can serve this on top of any type of rice or dressing. 
whatever you would normally want to serve duck with. Let me put a little of this apple sauce. Is that beautiful or what? Where are you ever going to find a duck dish that looks nicer than this? Let me clean my platter. And I'll decorate it again with a little color. I'm going to put some purple cabbage, a little golden bell pepper, and a little red bell pepper. And what a magnificent centerpiece for the table. Lake Bruin mallards on top of wild rice or whatever else you might want to serve with it. Okay, let me move all of this out of the way so I can get to this nice dish that I'm going to do for you now. Again, another great Lake Bruin dish. And this dish is going to be a pan-fried, get my skillet hot here. I want to do a pan-fried Lake Bruin striped bass. You saw how great that lake looked. Well, you can imagine the amount of game fish and all other fish that's just teeming in that beautiful 14-mile lake. Well, here I have a nice little striped bass. This is Oh, I guess probably about a pound. You notice these wonderful stripes running across. That's where the fish gets its name. And there's some dispute in Louisiana as to whether the striped bass or the largemouth bass is the better of the frying fish. But I can tell you, I've fried them both, I've baked them both, and I love them both. So I don't know. I won't argue that point with anybody. I like both of the fish, the striped as well as the largemouth. I'm going to put some little cuts right through the center of the meat because that way it'll cook much quicker uh, once I put it into my saute pan. Now again, I'm going to bread this fish or batter the fish with a little yellow corn flour. You can use cornmeal or white flour, but I'm using an egg wash, which is uh, egg, water, and milk, just a little bit of it in my bowl here, and then a little yellow corn flour. And the yellow corn flour is a really nice fine ground flour. In fact, I'll put a little salt and a little pepper, and of course, use whatever seasonings you would like. I'll take the fish, and I'll put it into my egg wash, just lightly on each side. And I'm calling this an egg wash because it's not a heavy, heavy egg coating. It's more of just a light wash uh, so that the batter will actually stay on the fish. And then into the yellow corn flour, and you notice I'm cooking this fish head on. And it's very important that I mention that because a lot of people question why would you cook a fish head on? But I want you to remember that even in the earliest days of Louisiana cooking, all of the fish, and I say in Louisiana cooking, throughout the world, all of the fish was actually cooked head on because it's edible. And at the same time, there's a lot of meat there. The only thing you want to remember is that you should take the gills out of the fish before you fry them because that's where some of the bacteria lies and you want to protect yourself for sure. Okay, I've put a little vegetable oil down into my skillet and I'm going to take the fish and put it down into that vegetable oil and I've got my fire nice and hot in the black iron pot. And of course you can use any type of oil that you want. You can use butter or you can eliminate the oil altogether and just put it in a skillet that's been lightly glazed with one of the vegetable sprays and it'll put a really nice coating on the outside of the fish. And while the fish is frying here, I want to make a really quick, very quick classical New Orleans sauce that you can duplicate in your home in about two minutes. And this is called a Bordelaise sauce. And again, I'm going to take my little black iron skillet over here. As you know, I love to use these skillets. I'm going to make a Bordelaise, but the Bordelaise sauce, though it's normally a Bordeaux wine sauce, Today, I'm going to put a little twist on that Bordelaise. I'm going to make a roasted garlic Bordelaise. I've taken garlic, put a little butter on it, put it into the oven, and cooked it for about oh, 30 minutes to an hour at about 350 degrees until the garlic became really nice and tender. And then I've taken the garlic. In fact, I want to show it to you. It's right here in my hands. I've taken the garlic, and I've pulled it out of the shell and it's got a wonderful roasted flavor to it. And you can imagine how nice that's going to flavor this Bordelais sauce. I begin by putting a little butter. And of course, you can use any type of low cholesterol oil. You can use any type of butter, margarine, whatever you would like to make this sauce. Normally in New Orleans, the classical uh, butter sauce, the Bordelais or Meunier, is made with whole butter. OK, into this little pan, once it gets nice and hot, I'm going to put the roasted garlic. I've got about 
six or eight whole cloves of roasted garlic. I'm going to put them down right inside of the pot there. I'm going to put a little bit fresh parsley down into the butter. I'm going to put some green onions chopped very, very fine down into it. And of course, this will begin to saute quickly. And of course, you can imagine the flavor that this butter is going to start to pick up in just a second. Now I'll put a couple pieces of fresh thyme sprigs right into it. And let me flip my fish over so you can, you'll notice that I hadn't been playing with this fish. I put it in the saute pan and I'm allowing it to cook. I'm not moving it around. That's why the batter falls off a fish. Take your time, let the fish cook. And I'll flip it over. You can see how nice, it is. look how beautiful that pan fried striped bass from Lake Bruin is looking there. And I'll take my garlic butter, I'll put a little bit Worcestershire sauce down in the bottom, and then a little bit of the Louisiana hot sauce. And I'm gonna take it off of the fire while I add a little bit wine to it because this wine may flare up. There you go. Talk about hot. See how hot those black iron skillets cook. Okay, now I've got a piece of fish that's already done, so I want to move this out of the way. And I want to get this fish that's already nice and fried here. Take a look at that. And I'm going to top it with this nice classical Bordelais sauce of the city of New Orleans. You just watch this. Right on top of that fish. Is that gorgeous? Is that beautiful? Does that not make you want to get in the car today and take off for Lake Bruin or St. Joe, Louisiana? I know good and well that I would. Look how gorgeous that is. A little bit. Red bell pepper right down onto it like that. And the fish is a real masterpiece. Remember, nothing to it, just quick frying, golden brown, and you have a fabulous dish. Okay, the next uh, thing that I want to show you quickly is this wonderful buttered apple dish that I'm going to show you right here. The buttered apples go wonderfully with any kind of game, especially ducks. You saw how much uh, apples I put in my duck dish? Well, I've buttered and sauteed some with a little cinnamon on the side, and this is a great, great dish to go with the duck. So I wanted to show you that really quickly. Now, I told you a minute ago that I had a fabulous friend come in to visit in the kitchen, Miss Emily Bruno. Emily has been in the restaurant business for 50 years. The fact is, you saw her restaurant just a minute ago, and she has taught me a lot about cooking in Louisiana. In fact, he is. She is one of the grand dames of cooking, Miss Emily. Come over here and give me a hug. What do you have here? John. Oh, this food smells delicious. <laughs> give me a hug. What? Oh, it's just wonderful to be here. Don't tell me you finally did I it. I finally did. After five years, I brought your favorite bread, raisin <laughs> bread. I've been uh -huh. asking you, I, I have to say, I've got to tell all of my friends, uh huh. I've been saying, Miss Emily, when are you going to make that raisin bread for me? You kept saying, John, I'm going to bring it. I'm going to bring it. And you finally um, brought it. Yeah, thank, thank you for yeah, asking this, me. Yeah, this is great. It's, it's, it's the best bread I think I've ever eaten in my entire life. Thank what you, a pleasure you. it is to have you visiting oh, with me today. It's a pleasure to be here. I've thank been you. in your kitchen so much. Thank you for asking. Let me ask you a question. Uh huh. You and I have been, we're both in the restaurant business. Mm -hmm. I'm a newcomer. <laughs> but you've been in it for 50 years. Why does someone stay in the restaurant business? Everybody says we work holidays, we're, we're working when everybody else is off. Why would we stay in the business? Well, we enjoy the work. First of all, you know, everything involves or revolves around food. Church, meetings, everything, social, card games, and what have you. So I enjoy people, and I enjoy being up there. And, and you know, I guess it's true because I do too, and I can find nothing more rewarding. Just think of the times that we visited, and in your yeah. in your restaurant in that town of St. Joe, which is a nice little bitty town. I guess everything takes place right there in your restaurant, it all does. the meetings and it everything does. else. They meet, yeah, yeah, they come meeting there and pace up a lot of deals. Of course, it's lot, very lot of, interesting. A lot uh, of deals and a lot of marriages took lot, place in yeah, that restaurant. That's right. That's right. Uh -huh. uh, most interesting. You know, when I travel through St. Joe, because I go to Lake Bruin quite uh -huh. a bit, I love that lake. And when I travel through St. Joe and I see that wonderful, sleepy little town, I think of just how great it must have been at mm -hmm. some point in history. 
What was the what was the main industry there, and where did your business come from in that town? Well, we, of course, had Lake Bruin. And then we're in the center of the parish, in South Parish. We have the courthouse, which attracts uh, people. And if they have a murder case, <laughs> which we aren't looking forward to, but then my place fills up. And then, of course, we had oil industry there in uh, the late, in the early 50s. And then we had... Uh, we didn't have the camps on the lake like we have now. People would fly in, come in and eat, and they'd come up there, you know, to rest, get away from their routine and daily life. Well, you know, uh, we were sitting in your place one day, and I was talking to a very interesting gentleman who I later found out was your son, by the way, and he was telling me that the road that went right in front of your restaurant used to be a toll road. And I said, right. you've got to be kidding, not in a little bitty small town, a toll road. He said, yes, it was called Plank Road. Plank Road, well, still what's is. The, what's, the, what's the story? How did it get a well, toll put on it? Some ladies came one time. They were all dressed up from out in the country in their wagons and saris. And so they came in and they couldn't get to town. And they had some chickens stuck out there in the mud. So the business <laughs> people had a meeting. And they decided, well, this is ridiculous. So they built a plank road, opened it at each end, and charged a toll. Now, at one point, we had this colored woman who was named Roddy, Roni, R-H-O-N-I-E. And she slipped around to keep from paying the fee. <laughs> and they called her and made her go back and pay the fee. It was a small fee to enter. And then everybody the had to pay a fee everybody from that had point to pay on. A fee. Yeah, they did. When I was in your restaurant, we had a one. In fact, is I stole a recipe from you, and I got to admit, I'm going to admit it in front of everybody. I stole a recipe for the most fabulous spinach pecan rice casserole I ever mm -hmm. saw in my life. I tasted it, I loved it, and they gave me the recipe, and I use it all the time. And since you're here with me today, I want to actually do that dish. If you'll help me, I want to do that pecan spinach rice. rice and you know it would be perfect to go under those ducks also look i've got a black skillet right here if you'll okay. take that black skillet and put it right here you don't mind helping me cook oh, the day, I'd do you? Love it. Love and i'm going right to turn i'm going to turn this fire up and get it on pretty high and then i want you to take some of that butter in my bottle that's not actually butter that's one of those buttery flavored oils that i use all the time that's about night now this is your recipe so look if i do it wrong <laughs> Don't tell anybody about it, okay? Oh, Just let me do Promise, <laughs> promise. I'm my girl's okay. cat widow. We're, we've got our nice old black iron skillet, and it's getting, uh, the, the butter will get good mm -hmm. and hot. And now, one thing that I did a little bit different than y'all did is that here in South Louisiana, you're up North Louisiana, we use a lot more seasonings and ve fresh vegetable mm -hmm. seasonings and everything we mm -hmm. cook. So I adapted the recipe a little bit by putting a little onion, celery, and bell pepper. You don't mind if I did that into Go the right spinach, ahead. do you? Right I'm mean, looking, I think I have a wooden spoon right there. You might want to stir this, Miss Emily. Okay. A little onions, a little celery. Can you imagine putting seasonings in vegetables? But that's exactly what I do. Onions, celery, bell pepper. And then I'm going to put some nice bacon. I've taken bacon and I've cubed it all up. I've fried that's it and I've that's put all of that down. And then I normally I also make this with the bacon drippings. I'll keep uh -huh. the bacon fat and I'll yeah. put it into the skillet. But we're going to cut a little cholesterol out today. What do you think? Well, that's uh, the trend of the day now. That's the, that is. Cut down on cholesterol. And we'll saute all of that around until we get some really, really nice flavor building up in the pot. Mm -hmm. And uh, a question. Mm -hmm. Were you ever tempted to leave that great little town of Lake Bruin to, well, to go out of town? Well, to some extent. Not to the extent that I really wanted to because I'm very happy there. And... Uh, at one time, I had a man came in from Monroe, from the Holiday Inn, and he observed me for several days, several weeks. And he walked up to me and he asked me one day if I would like to come to Monroe. Well, my husband vetoed it right away. <laughs> but it was a very good offer. And then I have some friends in New Orleans who had uh, invited me to come to New Orleans and open up uh, a restaurant or go in, you know. Right. But I'm just happy in this little town of St. Joseph. It's just like one big happy family. Well, and, you, uh, I, I try my best to get up to St. Joe at least five or six times a year because there's nothing like sitting there talking. To, there's nothing like a small town. You're relaxed. And yeah. You, yeah. Uh, you feel you know everybody. And I think a lot of the small towns in America are starting to disappear. And here's they one are. that's they preserved are. forever. Okay, now Let's we've got so. our onions, celery, bell pepper. Mm -hmm. We've got our... Our bacon in there sauteing around. Uh -huh. Now I'm going to put some pecans. Pecan. Y'all grow a lot of pecans. We have up a, had a good crop this year. Had a great crop. And look at here, I'm putting all these wonderful pecans. I've already 
uh, cut them into little bitty uh -huh. pieces. We don't have to be tight because we have plenty of them. Okay, you want to put the rest of them all right, Miss Emily? <laughs> Go ahead. I'll put them all in. You don't own a pecan farm by no, any I chance. No, I don't. Barbara, there, Bag <laughs> Barbara Bagley does. <laughs> Barbara Bagley, one of my great, great Mine friends too. from St. Joe. Now, the pecans will actually mix in that oil with the bacon and the onions uh -huh. and the bell pepper and garlic and all that stuff that I'll add in a minute mm -hmm. and start to give that real nutty, nutty flavor uh, to the spinach. Now I'll go ahead and put a little bit of the spinach. This is already poached off, by the way. Uh -huh. Now, I don't know whether you put fresh leaves in yours or not. But I I'll do, when it's do? available. Mm -hmm. I do. I love it's, it. But it's fine to go ahead and use the just fresh, the... The frozen? Yeah, you could use just frozen. Just to use the frozen spinach well, We prefer just the fine. fresh if it's available, you know, and we can get it. Miss Emily, mm -hmm. has the town of St. Joe grown over the years? Uh, well, uh, when it was incorporated in 1901, they named the town Densmore after a man who came there and settled and liked it very much. But then in 1903, they uh, uh, changed the name to St. Joseph because a Jesuit priest came down the river to Minster to the Indians who were settled there. Right. And, of course, he named it St. Joseph. At that time, the population was 735. Today, it's 745. <laughs> So in a hundred years, you've gained a... a yeah, but years. at one time, when I opened my restaurant, there were five restaurants there, two hotels. Is that right? We had three doctors, and it was a thriving little town. And we had a population of 2,250 people. Is this tre tremendous. Well, I tell you uh -huh. what, I'm glad that it's a town of 700 people. And I tell you, I hope to spend a lot more time on Lake uh -huh. Burn. I'm going to add a little bit rice to the spinach because that's all we have to do. And I want you to just continue to blend all of that into the spinach and pecans. And as I say, this is a wonderful, wonderful side dish. I'll season it with a little salt and pepper. Mm -hmm. And Miss Emily, I can't tell you how much I appreciate you coming to visit well, with me in the you. kitchen today. Thank and I want you to come back and do that again sometime. And I want all of you to come back and visit as we continue to cook up more of these great taste of Louisiana. See you later. Funding for this program was provided in part by Bruce Foods Corporation, makers of Bruce's yams and other distinctive Louisiana-style food products. Chef John Foltz has written a cookbook that allows you to explore the exciting world of Louisiana cuisine. The Evolution of Cajun and Creole Cuisine is a full-color, 352-page book containing food history and recipes for gumbo, jambalaya, mock choux, and other Cajun dishes. For your copy, send a check or money order for $24.95 to Louisiana Public Broadcasting at the address on your screen. To use your credit card, call toll-free 1-800-973-7246 or visit our website at lpb.org.